welcome to Forbidden Planet TV and we have our very special guest today, Samantha Shannon. Hi. Uh, and we're here to talk about our fantastic uh, special Straight Edge edition of A Day of Fallen Night. Um, so there's still a couple left to pre-order if you go in there quick. Um, so initially <laughs> Priory was going to be a standalone novel so what gave you the urge to revisit World or a world 500 years beforehand. Um, well, I should stress it is technically still a standalone novel. Yes. You can read the two <laughs> separately and you can hopefully read them in whatever order you prefer. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose it was because when I was building the Priory of the Orange Tree, it, it was a world that needed a lot of history because it is about how we tell stories and who controls history. So in order to tell that story, I had to put quite a lot of history into the book. Mm -hmm. And I became really interested in the history I was writing about, particularly about this event called the Greek Vages or the Great Sorrow, um, which was a war between dragons and humankind. And I really liked the challenge of writing a story about this because it's a novel where um, the, the end of the war lies beyond the human character's control, which is quite a difficult thing in a narrative because it means the, the characters can't do anything to hasten the end of the war. So it's a novel ultimately about surviving mm -hmm. long enough to see the end. And I really liked the challenge of that as an author and I hadn't done anything like it before. So that was what drew me to, to kind of returning to this world. And also some of the characters I had mentioned, like um, I really wanted to explore um, the House of Berethnet, for example, mm -hmm. which is mentioned in the Priory of the Orange Tree. We never actually get to see into the head of one of the Berethnet queens. And because the most famous Berethnet queen, Glorian, lived at this time, um, I was quite tempted by the idea of writing from her perspective. Yeah, it, it's quite interesting because it's almost like it's kind of those echoes and the things you've picked up from Prari and reading this, it's just really exciting to be like, oh, so that, oh, okay, I recognise this character, yeah. I recognise like that part of this world, which is very, very cool. Um, so how did you manage to kind of keep track of all the, all the different kind of narratives and obviously the different parts of the, the world? So I'm very fortunate that I have a really good memory, so I don't actually need a huge amount of notes to help with world building. I do say that I did make one small mistake in the text <laughs> I realised that went to print, um, which I will be correcting shortly. Right. Okay. Um, but mostly I can keep track of the details. I'm just quite fortunate I can, I just switch into roots of chaos mode and I, I tend to just remember a lot of things. So world building isn't really something I need to keep track of particularly. Mm -hmm. um, the most challenging thing I found about it was actually timelines um, right. because when you have four characters spread out across you know different parts of the world it's quite challenging especially if you need them to meet in one place mm -hmm. it's quite challenging to bring all of their stories together in a cohesive way that feels like it makes sense mm -hmm. so a couple of times I was stuck where I really needed to be a character to be in a different country but I didn't have a huge amount of time for them to get there so there was times when I was trying to come up with solutions like oh maybe you could ride a dragon together <laughs> my editor would be like no that's not you have not set a precedent for someone to ride one of the fire breathing dragons um, but yeah, I ended up just tweaking the timelines to deal with that. But it, that was that was definitely the most difficult part of writing this book was trying to get the characters to meet on the same day in the same place <laughs> when they've been all over the world. Um, and obviously the kind of, I suppose, the sheer amount of research. So it was obviously a lot of the research you did for Priory, were you able to kind of obviously put some of this into, into this book and also was more kind of research required? There was more research required, so the research I did on the legend of St George the Dragon, which the first book, well, all of the books in a way, reimagined, that was something I was able to carry across. But this, um, the Priory of the Orange Tree was mostly inspired by the Elizabethan era, kind of 17th century, 16th century. Um, so I couldn't really use any of that research because I was going back quite literally another 500 years. So this is much more broadly inspired by the medieval era, kind of ranging quite widely between sort of the year 800 through to about the 1400s. So it's basically the, the huge portion of the Middle Ages went into this. So mm -hmm. most of the historical research I had to start again from scratch. Yes. Yeah. Um, and which do you find kind of uh, comes first for you in the in the process? Like was because obviously the world has been established. So did you find that, OK, I'm going to kind of first kind of go with the characters I'm introducing or did you have to kind of start with the world again in any way? 
Um, I suppose it was a mix of both mm. because, you know, I, in order to think about which parts of the world I was going to talk about, I had to, in a way, think about the characters first because then I would think, although I had to redesign the entire world, yeah. there are some places we're going to be seeing more than others. So I knew, for example, that I wanted to return to the Priory of the Orange Tree itself yes. um, because even though the first book is called The Priory of the Orange Tree, we don't actually get to spend a lot of time there. And this time I really wanted to delve in to this matriarchal society and how it works because I think readers were left with a lot of questions about it because we did really only spend a couple of days there in terms yeah. of the actual narrative um so yeah, yeah. I, I suppose in a way the characters came first with mm -hmm. that but i knew i was going to have to essentially redesign the entire world because we actually this is the first book where we go to every country in priory's world or at least those that lie within the boundaries of the map or the known world we see every single country which was quite it, yeah it was fun <laughs> but it did mean a lot of building that needed to take place mm -hmm. And which do you find is a character that you just can't quit? Like who's who's kind of stuck with you the most from this book? They all appeal to me in such different ways in this one. Um, I mean, with The Priory of the Orange Tree, I would say Eid was my clear favourite, mm. just because I really enjoyed her storyline. I love court politics, that sort of thing. This time I really enjoyed pretty much all of them equally and I connected to them in different ways. Um, so Glorian, for example, I got to return to my 16 year old self, which was kind of <laughs> sort of nerve-wracking and fun at the same time. Um, Dumai was a character I really related to because we're about the same age mm -hmm. and we actually pretty much followed the same age as I was writing the book because the amount of time it took me to write the book is also approximately the same amount of time the book covers. Okay. So Dumai and I went from being in our sort of late 20s to mm -hmm. early 30s in the book which I that was really fun. Um, Tanuva I love just because she spends so much time in the Priory and I love that society so much and she's a very pleasant character to be in her head um, yeah. she's a very compassionate person and that comes across in how loving she is and also how loved she is mm -hmm. and also I was um, well I was experiencing a lot of grief when I wrote this book because uh, first of all we had the collective grief of the pandemic that was mm -hmm. going on and then I also lost all of my grandparents during the course of writing this book and I think with Tanuva I was able to really kind of process that grief and express mm -hmm. it in a creative way um, and then there's Wolf, who's absolutely nothing like me in <laughs> any way at all, but he was still great fun. And I particularly liked playing with um, language in his. Yes. Um, I really wanted to give him a very distinct sounding vocabulary, so I drew from Scots quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can definitely tell there's some a little bit cheeky and stuff about Wolf, yeah, which is, which is really very, fun. <laughs> yeah, very, very fun to read um, for all the characters, but Wolf in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so the role reversal of, as well, is just. Oh, I mean, it's something obviously I think comes across in some of your other books as well, but with the kind of men keeping the home and the women kind of mm -hmm. out there being like the the figure the figureheads and you know uh, fighting. So you know, is that obviously that theme's important to you? Um, yeah, do you kind of see that as being just an important part of all of your books? Yeah, and it actually comes into the Bone Season series quite a lot as well. So, for example, um, in the fourth Bone Season book, um, I draw on the legend of Orpheus and Eurydice. Mm -hmm. But Warden, the male character, is very much the Eurydice figure who's being rescued from the underworld <laughs> by Paige, who is Orpheus. And I think that can be fun because it can show the kinds of active roles that men have traditionally had in literature and to give those to the women instead. Yeah. And the entire inspiration for this series was to reapproach the legend of George and the Dragon, which mm -hmm. is, of course, the ultimate tale of the damsel in distress. It's about a knight rescuing a princess from a dragon. And I wanted to ask myself, well, what if the princess killed the dragon mm -hmm. instead? So that just does come into my work quite naturally. I mean, having said that, I, I like to celebrate women having those kind of traits we have classically associated mm -hmm. with masculinity, like, you know, being assertive or aggressive or good with weapons, uh, that sort of thing. But I also like to, cele to celebrate women who are more feminine and who have skills that lie outside kind of fighting and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think that strength should necessarily always translate to brawn. You mm -hmm. know, I like to have women who are good with politics, who are brilliant yes. artists, who are great public speakers. I think I like celebrating women in all of our diversity. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, warriors, but also women who suck with swords because that's important to you and I stand. <laughs> I am a woman who sucks with swords. <laughs> Have you ever um, you tried sword fight? No, because I know you I have suck. Oh, okay. You just don't suck. <laughs> I would cut my own head off. I'm not that. And obviously, the the writing style, as with Priory and uh, Bone Season, is so immersive. Um, so, how is kind of your how do you feel your writing's changed from Bone Season to to now? Kind of what what have you learned along the way? 
Um, well, I hope my writing feels stronger over the years. I think writing The Pirate of the Orange Tree, I describe it as an alchemical experience when I was able to unlock a different stage of my writing. Because strangely, the main season is first person, and that was very unusual for me, because throughout my teens, I always wrote in third. Mm -hmm. um, and Paige really took me by surprise with that narrative voice. Um, so when I switched back to Priory, it was kind of like I was going back to my roots. Mm -hmm. And I was able to flex my creative muscles a bit more in terms of things like description. Because Paige is quite yes. a down-to-earth character. She's not mm -hmm. going to suddenly do some lyrical description of a sunset, but I could get away with that a bit more in Priory. And I think with Day of Fall and Night, I was really trying to level up my craft. Mm. So one of the things I focused on was actually rhythm, um, which I've never really focused on that before. Every single sentence I was reading out loud to see the rhythm, and I wanted each sentence to feel like a small poem in a way. So that was something I've really never paid attention to before, mm. but I guess that's the next stage of the great work of becoming a writer. Yeah. <laughs> and um, talking of uh, bone season, mm. so I know obviously you're, you're currently kind of planning for the anniversary edition and so what kind of made you want to kind of revisit and um, rewrite some of that uh, fantastic debut? Thank you. Um, I've wanted to rewrite the Bone Season pretty much since it was published. Um, I was in um, I was in an interesting place when I wrote it. I was trying to do a degree. I was very young. Um, I was in a pretty dark place mentally, which I, I do think comes through in the content mm -hmm. of the book in some ways. Um, but I feel like because I was so young and I had this incredibly ambitious vision, but I just don't think that my writing ability at the time quite did justice to the vision okay. I had for the first book. And I was so desperate to return to that particular dynamic between the two main characters because it just had so much potential for me and I could have done so much more mm -hmm. with it. And I was so grateful when Bloomsbury said that they would let me do a very thorough edit on it. So I think it's now described as kind of the lush reimagining of the <laughs> season. I don't know if an author's ever really done such a radical sort of revision of yeah. an already published book before, so mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see how people react to it. Um, but I'm really, really proud of it. I just finished um, the, the responding to my copy editor's Ooh, notes. And okay. honestly, I'm just so chuffed with how it reads now. And it just, it, I think if it had been a standalone, I might not have gone back to it, but because yeah. it's the representative of the whole series. And I'm so, I'm just, I'm so proud of the bonus season series. And I love it so much, but knowing that it was represented by the book I considered to be the least skilled in the series, mm -hmm. I just really wanted to go back to that. So I hope it's a more accessible and hopefully interesting and fun introduction to the world. Oh my god. I mean, yeah, it's it's going to be incredible either way. So, yeah, yeah very excited. So, to uh, wrap up today's interview, because I know obviously you're in demand <laughs> today. Um, so, you always give me some really, really interesting um, recommendations. Mm -hmm. So, um, what would you say is one of the books you're most looking forward to this year? And what would be one of your most underrated books that you think needs more love? so many. Um, <laughs> I think one I would really love to see more love for is Juniper and Thorn by Ava Reed, which is mm -hmm. a wonderful gothic horror that deals with trauma in a really compassionate and layered and interesting way. I mean, I think Ava Reed is just fantastic. Like, I'm just, I think their work is so brilliant. And I was blown away by The Walk of the Woodsman, and I didn't expect any book to surpass that. And then I read Juniper and Thorn. I just think it's so different and unique. And the writing style is just stunning. Like it's mm -hmm. so lyrical and haunting. And I'm really looking forward to A Study in Drowning, which is Ava's next book. Um, I can't, I, there's so many books I'm looking forward to this year. I actually can't <laughs> think. I'm, I'm reading one right now called Mindbreaker by Kate Dillon, mm -hmm. which is the sequel to uh, Kate's debut novel, which was a really thrilling sci-fi that looks about, it looks at consent and corporate power and I have only read a few pages of that, so but I'm really enjoying it so far, and I think I'm going to name that as my most anticipated because I technically haven't <laughs> finished it yet, so it still counts. But yeah, I really enjoyed that. Brilliant. Well, yes, yeah, definitely on my radar. Um, but yeah, this book is just fantastic. It's starting. We've had such a great year already, and this is you know just continuing a fantastic year for books. So thank you so much for writing this. And thanks so much for coming today and, and signing many copies for us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Um, thank you. We will be back very soon with more FPTV uh, interviews. And yes, uh, pre-order links will be down below. So we do have a few signed copies left, but not many. So get on it. <laughs> Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators. Subscribe right here. See you soon.